Well, we're going through Matthew and paying attention to the places where Jesus calls people to follow him, um, or people asked to follow. And we, we had the invitation, first of all, of Jesus to the four fishermen, and they, they left everything and got up and followed him. And then last week we had um, the invitation where, where two came to him and wanted to follow, and then they um, did not follow for their own reasons. And today we come to the account of how uh, the writer of the Gospel of Matthew uh, leaves his vocation and follows Jesus. So here we are in Matthew 9, beginning with verse 9. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at a tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Well, this takes place again in this little village of Capernaum, and uh, you know it's on the Sea of Galilee, a uh, literal tropical paradise is, is what this place is. I mean, it's a really a neat place. And this is the new hometown of Jesus, and like I've said uh, in previous uh, messages, uh, Capernaum is strategically located on this caravan route that comes from Damascus down to the Mediterranean Sea. And so everything kind of explodes there. Things spread fast. And um, that's why we find Matthew, or Levi, as he's sometimes called, set up here along the route um, in his tax collector's booth and sitting beside the road, probably with a few Roman soldiers as his enforcers, and taking taxes from people as they pass through, taxes on their goods. Now, most of you, I know, are aware that in the Jewish community, tax collectors are considered unclean by the Jews who, who cared about things like this. They were unclean because they were constantly in contact with Gentiles. They handled Roman money that made them unclean. And uh, they mixed with everybody, and plus they were... Uh, traitors, so to speak, because they had sold out to Rome. And so tax collectors were, were not allowed into the Jewish uh, synagogues, or much less the temple. But they were shunned by everybody. They were unclean. And um, they were hated by most people because they were also rich in the way that they got their money. These were the one percenters, the tax collectors were. And so the people, nobody liked them. And they had no friends except uh, other tax collectors and um, Gentiles. So this invitation by Jesus to Matthew, it's really scandalous. I think we miss this, just how scandalous this is for an up-and-coming rabbi, a man that's being looked at as everyone, as potentially the Messiah, and now he calls a tax collector. This is the wrong thing to do. I mean, it really is. This is a bad start. If you, if you want to launch a political or a, a religious campaign, you don't start this way. This is not how you get things going. Nobody liked them. Nobody would approve. And in fact, the addition of Matthew into the disciples, the other disciples are not going to like Matthew. You realize that in this company of 12, one is called a zealot. That means that he is like in the local militia uh, ready to take over the government is what that means. He's going he's to rise up in arms against Rome. And now Jesus has brought into their fellowship this guy who is working for Rome. So even the disciples are not going to like him. It's, this is exactly the wrong thing to do. And as, as word gets around Capernaum, everyone would, would be upset about this. Here's Jesus, he's healing and he's teaching and he's drawing these growing crowds and, and everybody's, you know, just, he's just this magnet. People are thronging to get close to him. But then he calls Matthew. Not a good move. And that's exactly what Jesus did. And it reinforces for us what we've already learned, hopefully, that is no one's too poor, no one's too rich. No one's too uneducated. No one's too educated. 
No one is beyond the call of Jesus Christ because he calls us not based on who we are or what we've done, but he calls us based on our willingness. That's the only criterion, willingness. And Matthew's willing because it says he just gets up and follows. He just leaves his tax booth right there and follows Jesus. No excuses, no, oh, let me go do this first, or what about this or that? He just leaves his tax booth. And, you know, Jesus comes preaching the kingdom of God. Remember, the kingdom of God is at hand, therefore repent. And Matthew, he just turns, gets up and leaves and goes with Jesus. I think it's amazing. And Matthew doesn't just leave his old life uh, because he's so strong or he's, you know, just so ready or so disciplined. You see, obedience flows from our identity. And when, when Jesus is there, Matthew sees himself differently. Matthew begins to, to see his new identity as to who he is in Jesus' eyes. He follows because he's no longer Matthew the tax collector. Now he sees himself as Matthew a follower of Jesus. And Jesus gives him this new identity and the old one's gone. Uh, obedience, you know, isn't about doing something that you don't want to do. Obedience is about living into who God sees you. That's what obedience is. Obedience is about hearing God and then just living in this new identity. It isn't that you are afraid of displeasing God. You want to please him. And, and so you begin to see yourself that way. I have a, a plaque in my office that Nina gave me a couple years ago. It says, uh, and I'm sure you've seen this, uh, seen these plaques. It says, people may forget what you said or what you did, but not how you made them feel. That's true. I mean, the way that we feel around a person, who we, we feel as ourselves around someone else, is lasting. It's powerful. Uh, feelings are so powerful, both positive and negative, but uh, leaving your tax business when you, you know, like Matthew was, he's making a lot of money. And then you go follow this rabbi as his disciples. This doesn't make any sense. This doesn't logically compute here. And people are not going to respect you anymore. In fact, they'll say, what, what are you doing with him? A tax collector. That's what they're going to say to Jesus. Why did you choose Matthew? He's always going to carry this. He's always going to be Matthew, the tax collector in somebody's eyes, you see. But Jesus... When he's around him, Matthew sees himself differently. Jesus does, doesn't see a, a tax collector. He doesn't see a fisherman. He doesn't see a, a, a homemaker, or a housewife, or a prostitute, or a liar, or a scribe. Jesus sees Matthew in the kingdom of God, and Matthew feels that. Matthew gets that. This is who I am when I'm with Jesus. And so he gets up and follows. Um. Nina uh, likes post-it notes. I, I do too, but she writes little notes and books and on calendars, and you'll open up you know, the cabinet, and there'll be a post-it note there saying something to you. And uh, a couple months ago, she, she wrote one down that I copied, and I put it in my place where I put stuff like that in my little book, and it said, God, help me see as you see. You ought to write that down. God, Help me see as you see. What a prayer that is in the morning. Help me to see myself the way that you see me. You know? Instead of seeing myself the way that I think other people see me, or seeing myself based on what other people have said about me, or even seeing myself loaded with all this stuff that I've been carrying that's in my past, Lord, help me see me today the way that you see me. Because you see, uh, the expiration date has arrived for a lot of those things of the way we see ourselves. Okay, the, the statute of limitations has run out, so to speak, on the way that we see ourselves by some of the things that, that we're carrying in our lives. So God, help me see myself the way that you see me. That's what Matthew sees. We follow because we begin to see the way that God sees us and we realize that in his eyes we are forgiven. Uh, we are free, we are empowered, and God doesn't see all that junk. God sees us in his kingdom. God sees us through Jesus' eyes. Now, Matthew 
uh, what Matthew did next just shows us what following Jesus is really all about because he throws a dinner party for Jesus in order to introduce his friends to Jesus. Now, think, think about that just for a minute, okay? He's, he's just left his tax booth as the notorious Matthew tax collector, one percenter, sinner, you know. And what's he going to say to his buddies that are like him? Hey, guys, um, I left my lucrative business and uh, working for Rome. I'm going to follow uh, Jesus, you know, this man that you've heard about, the one that's doing all the healings and the miracles and stuff. And I'm not, I'm not really sure, guys, how this is going to turn out. Uh, he hasn't told me what his plans are for me yet. He just wants me to follow him. But I'm having a little party over, you know, at the house tonight. And um, maybe some of you would like to live, leave some of your six-figure, seven-figure jobs and, you know, sell the mansions that you have on the beach and give the money to the poor and come along and follow with me. I don't know. Maybe, you know, just a thought. You want to come to the party tonight? Matthew wants his friends to meet Jesus, meet this man who is changing his life because Matthew wants the same thing for his friends. And Jesus reaches Matthew, and then Matthew immediately reaches out to someone else, and he imitates the master as he uh, reaches out to his friends. We kind of have a dysfunctional habit or system in America, you know, when it comes to uh, American society that we think that it's impolite or it's rude to share your faith with other people. You know, just don't do that. Just, just nutcases do that, right? But you never talk about what you really believe. As a matter of fact, sometimes you'll talk to somebody you don't know very well much quicker, easier than what you talk to a close friend. It's, it's hard. I know it's hard to talk to a close friend about, about what, what you think about God, what you think about Jesus. And, you know, people argue about religion, so you don't want to get into that. And, you know, so we just say, stay silent. And it's like, okay, so Jesus has had this impact on my life, and he's changed my life. And I feel so good about myself now, and I see myself in a different way. And actually, I've kind of like died with him, and I've been born again with him. And, you know, everything is different, but I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to tell them. I don't want to tell my friends because, you know, well, they might not, I don't know. I just don't want to make them feel weird, really. So we've declared this man who lived 2,000 years ago to be the Lord of our life, but we're going to keep it a secret from the people that we care about the most. Isn't that kind of weird, really? We stop and put it that way. Isn't that kind of strange that we wouldn't tell the people that we love the most about this man who we say that we think is the ruler of the universe, the Messiah, the Savior of all, but we're not going to tell anybody because we don't want to make anybody uncomfortable? Right before this, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. So go out and be salty, right? It says, you're the light of the world, so let your light shine for everybody. Get on top of the hill. Don't cover it over, you know. Let your light shine out. Tell your friends. From time to time, we hear statistics about what brings people to church. Listen to this. Um, American Church Growth asked 10,000 people about what brought them to church the first time, what led them in. And here are the answers. Uh, I had some kind of a special need. All right, so something happened in their life, 2% of the people. Just a walk-in, just, just happened to go, you know, curious maybe, 3%. Of the pastor, 6%. Some kind of visitation program in the, in the neighborhood, 1%. Sunday school, 5%. An evangelistic crusade, 5%. A special program that the church had got me in, 3%. Okay, so all those things. You know, there's a lot of percentage left here, right? Friend, relative, 79%. 79% of us came to church the first time because of a friend or a relative. So Matthew shows us how to reach our friends. Throw a party. Party evangelism. Isn't this great? What a great idea. Uh, party evangelism. Uh, he invites Jesus over. What a great idea. We have our friends over, and we have a great meal, and we invite Jesus too, Okay. What a great idea. Now, this party that Matthew threw, it's, it's loaded with meaning. Obvious thing is who was there, 
He invites tax collectors. We know who they are. And he invites the sinners. I'd love to say that word. Sinners, you know. <laughs> Don't you love that? I just love that class of people. Sinners. You know, it sounds like they're really bad people, right? They just lump all these people together in as sinners, you know. And, and that means, what that means in Scripture when it says sinners means that they really don't care. It's like, I don't care what you think of me. I'm just going to do what I want to do. I don't care what some religion says. I'm a sinner. You know, people like that, they don't care what other people think. They're just sinners, right? Yeah, I, you know, these are the people back in their day, they're eating the barbecue ribs, right? They don't care what the Jews say about that. Going to eat shrimp, barbecue ribs, who cares? I'm going to work all day Saturday. What are you going to do about it, guys? Right? I'm going to hang around with bad people. Sinners. Didn't even try. They just said, yeah, I'm a sinner, so what? That's who's at the party. It's Matthew's friends, close community. I've known a few sinners. I've been in that category for a season you know, in my life. I've known people who just didn't pretend, didn't hide it. Some kind of flaunted the boldness of their sin. They kind of say, what are you going to do about it? Aren't you shocked? Today, for the most part... Um, the ones that do this really well, we call them celebrities, some of them, you know, is what we call them. Um, think of people like Charlie Sheen. Now, there's, he just doesn't care. He's making money off just being a sinner, right? He just is, who cares? I'm going to do it. Um, I thought of uh, Howard Stern, you know, these shock jocks. They just, who cares? I'm going to make my money by stepping over the line and, you know, I know there's more radical examples. I'm just not in the mood or in the groove there to tell you who they are. But here's the point. Jesus is a friend of the sinners. I like that, don't you? He says, I know who the sinners are. They're my friends. I got my friends. Now, I got to understand this scene. They're at a dinner party. Um, then they have a table that's about a foot off the ground. You know, evidently they didn't have cats and dogs, right? Or they wouldn't have had a... <laughs> A table that's a foot off the ground, but their table's about a foot off the ground. And instead of sitting, and the chairs hadn't been invented yet, you know. So, but so so they recline and they would you know lie down on the floor with some pillows and some mats and be propped up on one elbow. And then they're eating with their hands and you know they're dipping their bread in bowls and junk and you know. Okay, are you, you, you getting, this just makes me very uncomfortable. You know, when I'm sitting at a table and then we're seated too close, I just like, you know, I just want to get out of this. It's just like, you know, cover your food over, he's talking again, and, you know, that kind of stuff. And, and here they are, they're reclining at table, you know, and it's just so intimate. It's just so like everybody, just, you know, all your stuff. So that, you know, uh. Jesus is a friend of sinners, though. And he sits down, or he lies down at table, and for a long evening. And I, you know, I kind of see this this table a little differently. You know, there's Charlie Sheen, you know, and maybe Lady Gaga and Snoop Dogg is probably there, and Notorious Big and Jay Z and all these guys. And you know, that's, that's who's sitting around the table with Jesus, the sinners. This is Matthew reaching out to his friends. This is the kingdom of God in action. And this is what it really means to follow Jesus. It's to invite these people, you know, because Jesus is a friend of sinners and we're following him and we're going to be friend of sinners if Jesus is a friend of sinners because we're following him, right? Such is the kingdom of God. So follow me means that we become friends of sinners. Jesus teaches us what we never, that we never say no for someone. And I think that we do this. We go, oh, no, no, he, he wouldn't want to go to church or he doesn't want to hear my story because I, I know who he is and I, I know his language. His language is really bad. And so I know he's, he's, not gonna, he's not receptive. We think people that are receptive are people that are all buffed clean, you know. And, and Jesus is going, they don't need me. Uh, who really needs me are those people that have got the bad mouth, the bad habits, the sinners, he makes it a point that his message will be more effective and successful to the sinners of the world. There are many people still trying to grasp that. There was a marketing agent called Jackie Huba, and she says that many of Lady Gaga's fans identify with her concern for the outcasts and misfits, and that that's how she actually rose to fame wasn't her talent, but the fact that she appealed 
to people who grew up like her, kind of on the outside, you know. And, and Lady Gaga told this story uh, on MTV. She says, the boys picked me up, threw me in a trash can on the street, on the corner of my block, while all the other girls from the school were leaving and could see me in the trash. And everybody was laughing, and I was trying to laugh, and I had a nervous giggle. And I remember even one of the girls looking at me and said, are you about to cry? You're so pathetic. But what happened to Lady Gaga early on was she was kind of this, you know, this odd character, this kind of this misfit. And that's who came to her original concerts. Because she goes, she gets us. She's just like one of us. It's just like we're making it finally here. That's the appeal. And she says, all the weird kids, the artistic kids, all the bad ones. She says, and I love that because that's who I was. We're all together and they get it. It's their own little world. Jesus is a friend of the sinners. Jesus is one of Gaga's fans. See, Jesus fits right in here. He says, I came for them. Now, the Pharisees, they get upset, uh, and this might be kind of hard to understand, because they see Jesus eating with these people, these tax collectors and sinners, and it isn't that they just don't like those people. There's a radical difference between the Pharisees' worldview of how they say see the, that God and the world works and the, the worldview of Jesus. You see, the Pharisees say, we are clean. The Pharisees claim, because I've kept all this religious stuff, I wash myself, I pray three times a day, I tithe, I do all this stuff, and that makes me clean to God. And those people are dirty. And if if I associate with them, then I'm going to get dirty. The dirty will make the clean dirty. Jesus taught, he said, that he was clean, and yes, those people are dirty, but my outreach to them, me touching them metaphorically and physically will make them clean. The clean makes the dirty clean. See? The closer the dirty come to the clean, the cleaner the dirty became. I use the word touch there, you know, kind of for simplicity, but but let me put it up on the screen. The Pharisees equal clean touches dirty and the clean becomes dirty. Jesus equals clean touches the dirty and the dirty become clean. I know that looks really simple, and yet we don't get that most of the time. There's the mission of Jesus, just so simple. Jesus is the disinfectant, so to speak, to, to take this metaphor further. Uh, people change, you see. The Pharisees are saying, no, people don't change. You just change the outside, but you stay the same on the inside. Jesus changes the inside, and the outside changes after that. So Jesus seeks out the dirty people. He seeks out the sinners so that they might become clean. And he sends his followers out with the same mission to redeem the world, to reconcile the world to God through Christ. He calls the Matthews of this world, and he gives them his, this mission to become a friend of sinners so that sinners, and this includes us here, might be saved through him. Now, Again, I know that's really simplistic, but that is just baseline stuff that even a lot of Christians don't get. They just don't get it. They think going to church makes me clean. I need to clean up before I go to church, right? And that's, that's not the point at all. Some just don't believe in the change. Some in church don't like the fact that, don't, don't believe that because they don't really believe that God makes people clean. They think going to church makes people clean. Or scrubbing up your own life by your own willpower makes you clean. They, they don't believe that a person can change from being one who doesn't care and lives only for his or herself to being a person who tries to follow Jesus. And I see the same division today in our world that was right there in, in Capernaum. Then there were the Pharisees who believed that a person could only change by sheer will and that we must change ourselves to come to God. And so they avoided sinners, the very people who needed God the most, and they tried in vain to clean themselves up. And that, that strain is still alive. I mean, it really is. It's probably alive in parts of us too. But it's, I've always thought that it's funny that the church said, oh, we don't want them because they're dirty and they might infect us, you know. That's that old Pharisee attitude. Attitude comes from not believing in the transforming power of Jesus Christ. 
Then there were the publicans. The publicans uh, aren't in this, this lesson, but there were publicans in the day, and publicans, not republicans, publicans, okay, who in essence said, who cares? Who cares whether everyone is fine as they are? Don't worry about it. God loves you dirty. Just stay dirty. All right? We've heard this before, too. He says, he likes you the way you are. That's that, that, that strain is still alive today, staying the same thing. And they don't believe that people can change either. They said, there's no reason to change. Every, you know, what we hear today is that, oh, everybody messes up. No, nobody's perfect. Everybody makes mistakes. So therefore, just keep on making mistakes. Keep on messing up, right? Because God, God doesn't care. Well, Jesus cares a lot, you see, because all that dirt hurts you, hurts our lives. So he offers us his life. And he comes not just to the righteous, but he comes to all. And he sits down at the table with us. And when we realize that we are not worthy of his love, that we are not worthy for him to sit at table with us, then something changes in us. When we realize that we are not worthy for Jesus to lie down next to us and eat and put his bread in our bowls with us. Okay, when we realize that I don't deserve this, strangely, that gratitude changes our hearts. And that's kind of the beginning of conversion. And when we realize that I didn't earn this, I'm not worthy to do this, Jesus chooses me. Paul said it this way in Romans 5, 8. He says, God shows his love for us and that he died for us while we were yet sinners. Still sinners. And he dies for us. Doesn't call us to clean ourselves up first. He sits down at the table with us while we're still sinners. And in that moment, we begin to change. Our identity is changed from one who's trying to hide from God, who one who's trying to clean ourselves up for God, into one who's accepted by God, one who's pursuing him. Paul also said in Romans 2, 4, I love this little passage. He says, his kindness or his mercy leads me to repentance. We don't change because we're afraid. We're changed because of his mercy, changed because of his love. He is clean. We are dirty, but he makes us clean. Jesus calls us to follow him out. It, it makes no difference where we've come from, uh, what we've done, or what we've not done. Clean changes the dirty. And again, we can't make ourselves clean for him. Through the years, I've heard so many people tell me, you know, Don, I'm going to come to church someday. I'm going to come. And I said, well, why don't you come now? Well, you know, I got some things I'm working on. It's funny. You know, people say, you know, I've got some bad habits I'm doing. I kind of need to clean. I'm going I'm to come. One of these days, I'm going to shock you. I'm going to be there. And that, that all, all that comes from, I need to clean myself up. I need to start my part, stop my party. I need to watch my mouth. I get all those things done. Now I can go to church, you know. Never happens that way. That never, ever happens that way. Because you see, the power to do all that is in Christ. And you're saying, I'm going to make myself acceptable to Christ. Sounds like the right thing to do. But again, it's going off that whole Pharisee attitude. Never happens. Sometimes they find themselves, you know, among sinners and um, kind of at a Matthew Jesus party so to speak, and sometimes they find themselves really hungry for some food, and it's then that they realize that Jesus has come for them. Uh, Jesus did not come for them clean. He came for them dirty, and then that changes things. So, how are you today? Been trying to clean yourself up? Been, been trying to make yourself worthy of him? Can't happen. Let's come to, to Jesus as we are, accept the, the mercy and the love he gives us that, that takes us to repentance. Let's pray together. Oh, who are three?
thirsty Dip your heart in the streams of life Let the pain and the sorrow Be washed away In the waves of His mercy As deep cries out